So some years ago, uh, I was in a meeting with the leadership team at the church where I was currently serving. And in this particular meeting, we were discussing the performance reviews for some of our pastors and people on staff. And this one particular performance review came up about one of the pastors on our team that had some especially negative feedback in the review. Things like this person likes to hear himself talk, name drops, plays favorites, doesn't seem interested in other people. Someone who was clearly younger than me said his ideas about his own leadership are delulu. I don't even know what that word means, but it's something out there that's not good. But after hearing all this, my first thought was, how did this person get on staff? He doesn't sound like a pastor. I'm not even sure he's a Christian. And so I asked, whose review is this? And that's when I learned a really hard truth. Any guesses on whose review that was? It was my review. Thank you for saying that so (laughs) boldly out loud. I was going to say, you don't seem very surprised by it, which isn't very, discour- which is very discouraging, but turns out, and here's my point for sharing that vulnerable bit of information, <sighs> turns out uh, there's all these things that everybody else knew about me, but I didn't know about me, or in some cases, didn't want to know about me. It's like when you're in a group of people and there's that person that talks too much or stands too close or tells jokes that aren't funny, but everybody feels like they have to laugh anybody anyway. And everybody else in the group knows that they talk too much or stand too close, except who? That person, right? And we've all been there. We've all been, we've all seen that. And by the way, if you've never been in a situation like that, the person that everyone's thinking about is probably you. Okay. Just so I'm just kidding. I'm not just kidding. Because, and here's my point, the truth about you is that you don't always know the truth about you. And the truth about me is that I don't always know the truth about me. And not only that, we can come to convince ourselves all kinds of things that aren't true about ourselves that we come to believe are true about ourselves. For example, every day when I look in the mirror, I see truths that I don't want to know. Grayer hair, droopier skin, those huge lines on my forehead that get worse when I cringe about the lines on my forehead, that kind of stuff, right? So what do I do? I tell myself, well, Scotty, that's not how other people see you. They see you as, you know, younger and smarter and far less awkward than you actually are because human beings, we have this strange propensity, not just to deceive other people, but to deceive ourselves, even if we know better. It's so fascinating, like what other creature does this? A few years ago, I read an article, article called Our Infinite Capacity for Self-Deception. And in the article, the writer told the true story of a man named Victor Crawford, who worked as a lobbyist for the tobacco industry back in the 1980s. His job was to stop all kinds of, uh, any kind of anti-smoking legislation that would have diminished the industry's profits, even at the expense of people's health. But Crawford, was, uh, uh, he was also a smoker himself and was diagnosed with throat cancer at the age of 59 years old. And after he was diagnosed, he admitted that even though he defended the tobacco industry, inside, he actually knew better. Just before he died, he said this. He said, in a way, I think I got my just desserts because in my heart, I knew better, he said, but I rationalized and denied because the money was so good and because I could always rationalize it. I got to the point where I could say black is not really black. It's white, it's green, it's yellow. And friends, that's just part of the human condition. It's like there's something inside all of us that doesn't really want to know the truth about us. And so we go about our days telling ourselves things like, I don't have an anger problem, even though you're constantly flying off the handle at something or someone. Or we tell ourselves, I don't drink too much, even though you can't really get through an evening at home without a few beers or a few glasses of wine. Or you tell yourself, I don't think too highly of myself. No, I'm a super humble person, except you get defensive all the time when someone tries to give you feedback or correction. The problem is, What all this is, the spiritual weight of self-deception is the heaviest burden your soul can carry. Because as long as you don't know the truth about you, you can't live in the freedom that Jesus has for you. 
Which brings me to this message series that we kicked off last week called How to Unburden Your Life. And if you're here, we started with that great invitation of Jesus to come to Jesus and learn from Jesus how to live freely and lightly. And to guide our conversation for these weeks, we're going to be walking through this letter in the New Testament called 1 John. And the very first thing John writes about, you heard it in the scripture read just a few moments ago, is all about the spiritual burden of self-deception. Just to review, John puts it this way. This is what he writes. This is the message we have heard from him. That's Jesus. And now declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness, no deception, no deceit at all. So if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live in the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Now, before we go any further, I just want to call out something real quick. Uh, Choosing to walk in the darkness is not the same thing as being overcome or overwhelmed by darkness that you did not choose. Sometimes in life, darkness just happens to you. Uh, A breakup, a tragic loss, a, a difficult diagnosis. And you find yourself thrown into this really dark place. And I can tell you, I've been in moments like that. Many of you have been in moments like that. If you're here today in that kind of moment, I'm so glad you're here. This church is a safe place. It's okay to not be okay. But John here isn't talking about being overcome by darkness. He's talking about walking in darkness, choosing darkness, choosing to walk in darkness. And also, he's not talking about people way out there, that neighbor or colleague or family member who's already come to mind, who you think could really use a message like this. He's talking to you and to me, to people in here who are choosing to walk in darkness, but rationalizing it or deceiving themselves about it, or hiding it, to which John would simply say, you're living a lie. I've told this story before, so I'll spare you the longer version, but when I was in seminary, I started looking at pornography online. Even though I knew it was wrong, I knew it was dangerous, really addictive, but I was lonely, I was dealing with depression, and so I just rationalized it. I would tell myself things like, it's not that bad, or I'm still in control, or people involved in far worse things out there. But all that rationalizing only worked as long as I kept that secret hidden, which is a sign that there's a problem. And by the way, this is just a pattern around sexual sin, uh, just calling that stuff out. It's a pattern With all of my sins, actually, I can rationalize and try to hide all the ways that I can be selfish or greedy or unforgiving in my life. And here's the thing. I'm guessing right now I'm not the only one who has this problem. In fact, just a show of hands, confession's good for the soul. Has anyone else ever hid something that you've known to be wrong in any way? Have you ever hid some? Hands up. All of them. See, most of your hands are up. And by the way, if your hand's not up, you're doing it right now. So welcome to the club, like you're welcome, you're right at home here, because here's the deal, we all do this. This pattern, this pattern in human nature goes all the way back to the very beginning of the human race, when the first human beings sinned against God, and when they heard God walking in the garden, what did they do? They hid. Why? Because they did not know how God would respond. And friends, the reason, the primary reason why we don't live honestly in our lives is because deep down we are afraid of how God will respond. And just to name it, this fear is another huge burden to carry. Because the more afraid you become, the more you hide. And the more you hide, the more afraid you become. And the cycle just goes and goes and goes. And we think all this hiding is keeping us safe, right? We think all this hiding is somehow protecting our lives in some way. But all it really does is keep us isolated. Which is why John says when we walk in the light, when we tell the truth about ourselves, we get what? Fellowship with each other. Meaning you're no longer alone. You know, this is what an alcoholic uh, discovers in that very first AA meeting. They think to themselves and they realize, oh, wait, I'm not the only one. 
And I would argue, I would argue this is what broken, imperfect followers of Jesus should discover any time they walk into a church. Oh, wait, I'm not the only one. But sadly, so much of how we do spiritual life and so much of how we do church today just reinforces more hiding. And friends, this is exactly what the enemy wants. The enemy doesn't care if you go to church as long as you keep hiding. The enemy doesn't care if you pray all the time as long as you keep hiding. The enemy doesn't care if you read your Bible 24 hours a day as long as you keep hiding. He still will have power in your life. So what do we do? Well, look at what John says next. This is in verses eight and nine. He says, if we claim to be without sin, we what? We deceive ourselves and we, the truth is not in us. That's what we've been talking about. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So right here in the text, John gives us two very different ways of dealing with the darkness in our lives. We can either claim to be without sin, meaning we can deceive ourselves, hide our sin, rationalize it even though we know better, live in fear, and just plan to take all those secrets to the grave. That's one strategy. Or we can confess our sins. We can tell the truth. We can take a step of great vulnerability and faith and then, and then receive God's forgiveness. Now, put that way as those two choices, it would seem obvious what the better choice to make actually is. And you'd think we would all make that better choice, but we don't. Why? Because so often we try to come up with what I call a third option or a third way that tells the truth-ish, but still hides that sin over here. Just to illustrate, or example, just to illustrate so you can see how this works. Last summer, uh, Nina asked me to water the plants while she was out of town on a trip, which I did. I watered all the plants in the backyard and in the flower beds, but I forgot to water the really pretty ones on the front porch. They were begonias or mandevillas or teradiddles, or I don't know what they were. They were some kind of plant They were really pretty, but I forgot to water them. And so when she got home and she saw the really pretty plants on the front porch that weren't looking so pretty anymore, she asked me, hey, did you water the plants like I asked? And almost without thinking, I looked at her and said, of course I did. Now, in my mind, I was thinking, I'm being honest because I watered the rest of the plants. Problem was, she wasn't asking me about the rest of the plant. She was asking me about the ones on the front porch, the almost dead ones that clearly had not received any water. But you see, I was trying to find a third way, a way where I wasn't telling a lie, but I also didn't really have to tell the truth because I didn't want to feel guilty about doing the former, but I didn't really want to take the risk of doing the latter. Are you with me in this? Am I the only one that does this? All right, I'll just keep going anyway. Here's the thing. John in this text does not give us a third option. He says either we can claim to be without sin and just find some way to deceive ourselves. It's not a big deal. It's not a problem. It's mostly true. Or we can confess our sin. Meaning we can hide the truth or we can tell the truth. And so a couple of hours later, I found her and I, and I, said, I said, honey, I wasn't honest with you. I didn't water those plants on the porch that you asked about. Uh, I said I did, but that wasn't really the truth, and I'm really, really sorry. Now, question for you. What do you think hurt worse? That plant dying or her not being told the truth? Not being trusted enough to be told the truth? It's not a quick trick question. You, I know you know the answer, right? Not being told the truth. And the same is true with God when we don't trust God enough to tell him the truth. I mean, think about it. God knows your sins. Not only that, God, through Christ and his life on earth, understands your sins. Not only that, he's already forgiven your sin. So if he knows your sin and he understands your sin and he's already forgiven your sin, why are you still not telling him about it? And by the way, when I wasn't truthful with Nina, she knew Guys, they always know. Women always know. Don't kid yourself about it. So I wasn't deceiving her at all. Guess who I was deceiving? Myself. 
me. And I'm just so thankful that she was forgiving. And here's the better news. So is God if we confess, if we confess, if we confess, God will be, not may be, not might be, God will be faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Friends, I cannot tell you how good news this is, how much good news this is. That's right. Earlier we talked about the reason we, don't, uh, we hide our sins because we don't know how God will respond. And here's the reality. Lots of people in our world don't know how God will respond. They really don't know because they don't know Jesus. But Jesus is the proof that this verse is true. His life is the evidence that God's grace isn't some kind of wishful thinking. We don't have to cross our fingers and just hope God's going to be gracious. No, Jesus has made it clear there is no sin he won't forgive. And even better, no amount of times he won't forgive it. And by the way, Jesus doesn't do this begrudgingly. He's not some old curmudgeon in heaven saying, fine, I'll forgive you this one last time. No, Jesus is for you. He's on your side. He wants to unburden you from the weight of your sin. It's why John wonderfully concludes this part of the letter by saying, my dear children, I write to you so that you will not sin. You don't have to fall into this, but... But if anybody does, guess what? You have an advocate. You have an advocate in Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not just yours and mine and ours, but for the whole world. That includes all of them, even the worst ones. You see, Jesus is not just your forgiver. He's your advocate. He's done the work. He's paid the price. He's made the way. But you have to do your part. What's your part? Telling the truth. Telling the truth. I think one of the most powerful, transformative moments in recovery groups like AA or groups like that is simply when people introduce themselves. They say, hi, my name is Scott, and I'm an alcoholic, or I'm a sex addict, or I'm a gambling addict, or whatever it may be. Not, hi, and here's what I do for a living, or here's what's on my resume, or here's what kind of car I drive, or here's you know, the schools that my kids got into. It begins with humility and vulnerability and simply telling the truth, and that's what changes the culture of the meeting. That's what changes the culture of the community. And here's the wildest part of all that. This practice didn't start with AA. It started in the church of Jesus. It's a great picture of this in Acts 19 when a group of people in a city called Ephesus came to faith in Jesus. And we're told, look at this, many of those who believe now came and what? Openly confessed what they had done. Like walk into the building, here's what I did this week. Can you imagine, like it sounds so awful and awkward and terrible, but it's the secret that unlocks freedom in the church. They openly confessed, told the truth, stopped hiding. But somewhere along the way, for some reason, we have made this step optional or purely private or merely therapeutic. And in doing so, we've turned the church into a place where it's safer and better to hide. Why? Because we've turned the gospel of grace into a gospel of personal sin management. It's like I walk in and as long as I can convince you that I've got my sin under control and you can convince me that you've got yours under control, we can smile, worship, and go about our business. And in doing so, we actually miss the reason that we're here. And we miss the power of the gospel, which is not about how well you can manage your sin. By the way, you cannot manage it. And if you think you can, it already has you beat. It's about how well Jesus has already defeated it and overcome it through the cross on your behalf And by the way, this burden, this this managing our sin this way, this hiding and pretending, and so it's, it's the main reason why so many Christians today are so burdened and burned out. And you wonder why people out there who need some good news and who need some hope come in here and think, I don't want any part of this place because we're doing the same thing they do in their office or their schools or everywhere else, pretending to be something we're not. Because when you don't live in the truth, guess what? You don't have freedom. And if you don't have the freedom Christ paid for you, what good news have we got for people out there? But 1 John makes it clear that to unburden our lives, guess where we need to start? It's where he starts this letter. (laughs) 
not with prayer or reading the Bible or going to church. Those are really good things. He starts with confession. He starts with telling the truth. If we can't be truth tellers, if we can't lean into this, then what the what are we doing, right? And not just to go to church and check a box kind of way, which by the way, depending on your church background, maybe this whole idea of confession may feel like I just gotta go through the motions and kind of check a spiritual box. That's not what this is about. In fact, years ago, I was walking by a church that had a sign on the door about confession. I took a picture. I thought it was so funny. It said, confession today will be until exactly 530. There's only one priest available for confession. So make your confession direct to to the point and confess only your sins and offenses. I love this. No need to explain why you did it. Thank you very much. Wow. We don't want to know. We don't care. Let's get you through the machine and get you out of here. We're just doing the thing today, right? I'm not talking about checking a box. Remember the goal for the series, we talked about this last week. It's about character transformation and more intimacy with Jesus and growing our faith. And you can't grow closer to Jesus and hide from him at the same time. You can't do it. I can't do it. Nobody can do it. So how do we come out of hiding? Well, first, first, we need to have the courage to learn to name our sins clearly and directly and specifically, which is really hard to do. It's really really hard. I'm a words person. It is really hard for me to use those kind of words. But one of the ways that we get so good at hiding our sin isn't by denying our sin. It's by being very ambiguous about it. Think again back to the first sin in the Garden of Eden when God found Adam and Eve hiding in fear. And Adam confessed. He confessed, but in a really ambiguous way. He said in Genesis 3, uh, 10, he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Which is true, but notice he kind of left out that really small detail about eating the forbidden fruit, right? Like the one thing God said not to do, he didn't say anything about that. So we have to learn to be clear and direct about our sin. We have to be able to say things like, I drink more than I should, or I spin the truth to get what I want, or I talk about people when they're not in the room, or I judge people who just sin differently than me, or I carry grudges, or I watch pornography, or whatever it is, get really specific. Confession means naming sins specifically. To whom, you might ask? Three audiences. First, We have to confess to ourselves. We have to start by confessing to ourselves just so we can break the cycle of self-deception. I recommend writing things down in a journal or a safe place where you can see it and read it because you can't confess to God what you're unwilling to admit to yourself. And if you're not willing to admit it to yourself, it's never going to come out of your mouth to God. It just won't. So we start by confessing to ourselves, getting real specific about it. And then we confess to God. And not because God doesn't know. Friends, God already knows. He knows, he knows, he knows. We confess to God. Why? So we can grow closer to him and experience his love. You see, I tend to think that God, at a fundamental level, God is bothered by my sin or annoyed by my sin or disgusted by my sin. But the truth is, God feels joy when I come to him with my sin and my struggles. He feels joy. pastor named Dane Ortland put it this way. Jesus does not get flustered and frustrated when we come to him for fresh forgiveness, for renewed pardon with distress and need and emptiness. That's the whole point. It's what he came to heal. Jesus feels joy when we come to him with our failures and we get to experience his love and his grace. That part of God that feels so far away that's hard to believe is often because there's something I'm withholding and hiding from him and so I don't get to experience his love in that part of my life. And so we confess. And one of the ways that you can learn to do this in your everyday life, like, and I mean doing this in your everyday life, is through a practice called the prayer of examine. It's a daily prayer that helps you walk back through your day, gives you space to confess and receive forgiveness, all in the context of God's loving and gracious presence. And so we put an example of this kind of prayer on our resource page for the series, which is at northshore.church slash practices. Every week in the series, we're going to post a practice and a way for you to go out and put this into practice in your life so you can experience it in your life. 
We confess to ourselves, we confess to God, and then third, the practice of confession involves telling another person. James 5, 16 says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, this doesn't mean that after the service, you should walk out to the coffee stand and tell that person in line the worst thing you've ever done without telling your name, like you don't have to go there. Not everyone needs to know everything about you, but somebody does. Somebody does. You need what I call a fully disclosing friend or friendship, a fully disclosing friendship, someone who loves you and knows Jesus and with whom nothing is hidden. I have a good friend who lives in Seattle who's one of my fully disclosing friends. And we talk on the phone for about 30 minutes every week, every week. We talk about my work, my marriage, my sex life, my thought life, my attitudes, my actions. And I'll be honest, it can be hard. It can be painful. It's embarrassing at times because confessing sin is embarrassing because I'm made for more, right? But I can tell you this as well. I feel less burdened after every single call, every time. And it's not just because he keeps me accountable, it's because he reminds me that God forgives. When I confess, God forgives. In fact, I texted him something just this past week that I needed to confess, and he sent me a verse, not knowing anything about this message. You know what verse he sent? 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin, God was faithful and will forgive you your sins. And I'm sitting there going, okay, God, I get it, I get it, I get it. And the best part is we do this for each other. I confess my sins. He reminds me of God's forgiveness and he confesses his sins to me and I get to remind him of God's forgiveness in his life because that's what Christian community is all about. It's not about faking it. It's not about having people think you're doing better than you are. It's about giving and receiving forgiveness through Christ to each other. You don't have to be a priest. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to listen and remind them that no matter how great the sin, God's grace is greater and his faithfulness is greater. And what gift it is that we get to give that to each other each week, every day, all the time. That's why we're here. That's why we need each other. And this is what Jesus died for, to take on the punishment for every sin, every impatient response, every act of lust, every resentful thought, which means you've got two choices right now, friends. You can take that secret you've got to the grave and live a fearful, hidden, burdened life, or you can take it to the grave of Jesus, the empty tomb, where you'll find freedom and hope and forgiveness and new life. And so that's how I want to conclude our time together. That's what we're going to do right now together. So if you're able, I want to invite you just to stand up. And we're going to confess and seek forgiveness as a community, as a church together. And we're going to put the words on the screens for you. And we're going to read through these pretty slowly because I want you to let your heart really reflect on what these words actually mean and what they mean in your life. Let specific situations come to mind. Let moments and people come to mind because these words are true for all of us. Nobody here's better, nobody here's worse. We're all sinners at the foot of a gracious God. We all need grace, but to experience grace, we gotta tell the truth. And we're gonna start right now. So let's read these words together. Almighty Father, forgive our sins. Forgive the sins that we remember and the sins we have forgotten. Forgive our many failures in the face of temptation and those times when we have been stubborn in the face of correction. Forgive the times we've been proud of our own achievements and those when we have failed to boast in your works. Forgive the harsh judgments we have made of others and the leniency we have shown ourselves. Forgive the lies we have told to others and the truths we have avoided. Forgive us the pain we have caused others and the indulgence we have shown ourselves. Father, have mercy on us and make us whole for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.